Okay, it looks like we might have lost our anthem somewhere in the shuffle here. So we'll move into the sermon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can gather in your name, even if we're doing so separately and apart as we are. Lord God, we pray that we would hear your word and that it would root itself in us, especially on this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust that you will meet us here, for you are good. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as you probably know, today's Easter We celebrate the rising of Jesus. We mark the empty tomb. The rock has been rolled away, and the Savior is no longer lying in the grave. We rejoice at the raising up of the one who saved us and who taught us using stories. Jesus, when he walked with his disciples, he loved to look around and tell stories based on what was near him. He would draw analogies that could help people understand his meaning, his life's purpose, and even the kingdom of God itself. For those of you who read the Bible, you'll know that there are famous beginnings. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is in you. There once was a woman by a well. A son once asked his father for his inheritance a little early. The followers of God have been using these stories for ages. In the beginning was the word. God created the heavens and the earth. And then we, like Jesus and his followers, we see it in creation. We notice things. Poet, playwright, philosopher, book writer, Wendell Berry asks the question. It takes all of two words to ask this question. He says, what banged? And then a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. And then there's amazing grace, the sweet, sweet sound. And up from the waters, we rose. Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Stories. The people of God are a people of story. A mentor of mine used to love to tell this one story. When he was a new minister, he was working in the the middle of the country, And he had a very elderly clerk of session. I think the guy was well into his 80s, maybe into his 90s. He's a farmer. He had fought in a war. He had scratched a living out of the earth for him and his family. And after one particularly long and frustrating session meeting, he looked at the new minister and he said, if you don't believe in resurrection yet, watch this. And then with gusto, he put his hands on the sides of the chair and he threw his body up and said, there it is again, I'm up. Easter and resurrection are important because there's the potential to not get out of the grave. That's the whole point. If you think people who believe in resurrection are so ignorant that we don't understand that people die and they stay dead, then you're really not paying attention. We were once far from God, fallen, broken, sinful, and now, thanks to Christ, we get close to God again. A lot of people don't like any discussion of sin or fallenness. Over the course of land, some of us have been studying animals on the brink of extinction reading about how we are complicit in their pain and in the precariousness of their situations. It's been a humbling reminder that none of us are as innocent as we think we are. If you joined us on Good Friday, you heard about palm oil and its relationship to half the products in a grocery store and also its relationship to orangutans. On Good Friday, we read the story of an elephant that was killed for its tusks, how the other elephants came around and spent two days wandering the site, noticing the location of the death. 
And in the same story, we read about a woman who's trying to buy a gift for her fiance and has no idea the true cost, the true price paid for the gift. As we went through the book, we read many stories of wonderful creatures. They show joyous character of God. Animals who dance for the sheer fun of dancing. Animals who prance and run for the sheer fun of feeling their bodies move quickly. Animals that exhibit an incredible plethora of colors. Animals that can fly 14,000 miles and land on a beach at exactly the right time when the crabs are coming out. On and on it goes. The story of the animals. As Christians, we might come back to this one. We might just say, you know, Noah, he built an ark. And then it started raining. Stories matter. The Easter story matters because we do and we think terrible things. And then God does something about it. I was once chided by somebody. They said, I point out sin and brokenness in people's lives too often as a minister. And this is what they said. They said, look around at all the little old people that you preach to. They haven't done anything bad in years, which personally I thought meant they have not spent a lot of time with elderly people, in my opinion. So why do you speak of brokenness to them? Just give them comfort. It's all the people need. They need comfort. But I think true comfort can only come if we understand the power and the magnitude and the importance of the empty tomb. I've used this illustration a few times, but I think it works well, so I'm going to use it again. Most of us know there's this thing called the drone. It flies, you know, little thing. Amazon uses it to deliver packages in some places. Some Researchers actually use drones to follow herds of animals as they cross terrain so that it's less intrusive to the animal. It's a way we can watch them and see what's happening. Sometimes we use drones to protect people. Sometimes we use drones to sell things. Sometimes we use drones just because it's cool to hold a little remote control and have a thing fly. We do it for the fun of it. Militaries use drones. They use them to surveil it, do surveillance, and they also use them to bomb people. I would wonder, though, what if I had a special drone, the pastor's drone, and I was following you around everywhere you went for the last 24 hours, just just the last 24 hours, and the microphone was picking up every thought you had. That made it that I could do a share screen on Zoom, and I could show everybody what you did the last 24 hours and the audio track running would be what you thought. How many of you would stay sitting in your chair right now? Would you be scared of what your spouse thinks or your kids think or what everybody else thinks when they realize what you did the last 24 hours and more importantly, what you thought as you did it? I'm going to guess that there's not a person watching this right now who would like me to do that. You see, we need a savior. We need the empty tomb. Every one of us. We're actually living in the sixth great extinction period of the planet. Did you know that? There's more than one million species on the verge of no longer existing. This is the sixth great die-off our planet has seen. But you know what's special about it? All the five other ones were happened with major geological activities, volcanoes, possibly comets, this kind of thing, certainly not caused as a byproduct of any one animal. And now here we are. The cost is beyond our money. Every time we buy something, the cost is more than what we buy. Every good we consume, every extra coat in our closet comes at a cost. Now, Gail Boss, through Lent, she's broken our hearts for those of us who've been reading it. Like, literally, I've had multiple people from this group call me in tears, having read some passage. She talks about these animals that Jesus loves, that he delights in. 
And then she ends her study with the Taki horse. And I'm going to read the whole story for you, partly so you get a sense of what this journey has been like, but partly because she's talking about an earthy resurrection about the Savior from outside doing at great cost and great risk and with great love that which the animal cannot do for itself. Stories were used by Jesus to make the point he was trying to make. Can we understand the story of the empty tomb when we hear of the empty steep where suddenly the horses run? I'm going to read it for you, and then we'll keep going. So this is Gail Boss. You can read it anytime you like. The last wild one vanished from human sight in 1969. Mongolian herders saw him like a mirage off in the yellow hills. And then they didn't. Though to Western science, his kind didn't exist until 1878, the nomads knew him as ancient and immortal. He was untamable, progenitor of the horses that made their lives possible. Science named his species after the man who delivered a skull and hide for analysis To the Mongolians, living at the edges of his realm, his and his kind had always been Taki, spirit. In a land of extremes, herds of Taki thrived for tens of thousands of years, perhaps because the nomads believed them immortal. They drove ever larger flocks of sheep and goats into spirit horse grasslands. The Europeans and Americans got news of the only horses never tamed for human use. They wanted them. Expeditions captured tacky foals by shooting the uncapturable stallions and mares. Held in circuses and zoos, the tacky young died. In the end, 12 survived. The last free talkie had vanished when a 19-year-old Swiss woman saw wild horses painted on the walls of the caves in southwestern France. Their haunting beauty, stroked on stone by prehistoric artists, touched her, as did her realization that all the animals, aurochs, ebex, bisons, bears, leaping among the horses, had disappeared from that landscape. None of them were left. She went to see Taki enclosed in a zoo, and her sadness seeded a dream. Fifteen years earlier, in the mid-1950s, a few conservationists had decided to devote themselves to the last captives. They began a careful breeding program with the 12 surviving in Munich and Prague. Encircled in their attentiveness, the Taki multiplied and multiplied, and by the early 90s, zoos and parks in 33 countries had 1,500 horses. At that moment, the Swiss woman was ready. Since seeing them painted on a cave and penned in a zoo, she had given herself to wild horses, learning everything about them. In 1993, she selected six stallions and five mares born in the captive breeding program and brought them to a protected plateau in the south of France, land that echoed their ancestral home. Though experts warned against it, she then released the zoo-raised animals to run freely and form their own societies. Some had never grazed grass. A decade later, the little band of 11 had swelled to 55 horses that remembered who they were. Aggression among them had ebbed and stallions no longer killed the foals. It was time to begin taking the Taki home. Twelve were coaxed into small crates in the hold of a cargo plane. The woman and her team sat among the crates for a 45-hour flight, feeding the animals apples and hay, singing and telling them stories. When they landed on the remote steep in western Mongolia, a crowd of herding people met them. 
Some who remembered spirit horses from their childhoods had ridden their tamed horses more than 100 miles just to see Taki again. Most rode to see them for the first time. The crates were lined up on the windswept steep, smelling the wild the horses neighed and pawed at their wooden floors. Elders poured a blessing of the mare's milk over each impatient captive. Then in unison, the men perched on top of the crate, lifted the slats, and they set the taki free. Above the sound of the hooves pounding away, the men, the women, and the children, they cheered, they clapped, and they wept. Thank you, they said. Thank you. Other taki lovers have brought horses home to two or more places in the Mongolian wilderness. Across the border, Chinese conservationists protect a herd, as do Ukrainians, Kazakhs, and Russians on expanses of steep where they've fought wars to call their own. Across their ancient homelands, as many as 2,000 Taki run and live wild lives. A herd flourishes, get this, this is, this is resurrection and... Herd flourishes in the 1,000 mile Chernobyl exclusion zone, evacuated and declared a dead zone after the nuclear reactor exploded in 86. Taki can run free. Once extinct in the wild, Taki are now designated simply as endangered. This is good. But it's only the beginning, the Taki woman says of her dreams. We want not just to bring the Taki home, we want them to live for millions of years. Where once they were extinct, where once they were dead, where once they were no more, they're now present. We are in that story. Jesus places us in stories. And if you know how to read, you know you can be in more than one spot at a time. So I would suggest we are the horses, recently liberated, wild, running free. And we are also the woman, capable of sacrifice for the benefit of others. I imagine the people danced when those spirit horses returned to their area. You can close your eyes and see the wild horses running free for the first time, joyous, bounding, unfettered, doing what they were meant to do, being what they were meant to be. We all want that for the horses and for us. And we can use that as a jumping off point, right? We can become more Christ-like. Who's, we're made in Christ's image and he's in us. So caring for creation, loving the creatures, the spaces, the trees, the rocks, the field, it's part of the story. And thanks to Christ, he sends his Holy Spirit. It empowers us in the steep of our lives. We can grow in Christ-likeness even where there's currently nothing. Being gentle, being kind, being self-sacrificial so that others can have the joy. Living beyond ourselves, loving others as Christ did, as the woman in that story did, we will find ourselves prancing like horses. I can't tell you how many people have overcome major personal traumas, anxiety, depression, by helping others. I'm not going to give you a guilt trip that you got to do a whole bunch of stuff and try more harder. That's not what Easter is about. A couple of years ago when we lived in BC, the premier of BC actually did a speech on Easter and she said, you know, Easter is all about how hard work pays off. I thought, oh my goodness, okay. Today's Easter. We celebrate Easter because it's a sign that the story ends well, despite whatever we're doing. Despite how bleak today might look regardless of what's going on in the world around us, the story ends well. The tomb is empty. Salvation is all things being made new, all people, all places, all creation, renewed, restored, back where it's supposed to be. The lion hanging out with the lamb, the horses running free, the people's tears are dried up. The tomb is empty. 
Let's run and be free and give thanks to God for it. Amen.